Welcome everybody, this is Joy Hall Bryant. Glad to have you with us today. The topic is procurement and digital accessibility. And we'll get started with that in just a moment. If you want to know more about other topics we're hosting, the best thing is to go to our calendar at dir.texas.gov. Click on the calendar link, which is at the top of every single page. Um, and you may also want to join one of our discussion lists. Jeff, do you want to mention accessibility before we go on? Or are you going to talk about it later? Um, I, can, I can mention it now. So uh, DIR has a discussion list. It used to be known as PESO, and we just uh, pretty much changed the name of it uh, to DIR-accessibility. And um, you can find that on our uh, community page. And that is a, a discussion list that I use to convey information it's relevant to all things accessibility, <clears throat> whether it, it could be news articles, it could be uh, webinars that are available, you know, outside of DIR or other places or inside. Uh, and it's a place where other people can, can pose questions and be able to get an answer from people that are kind of, uh, you know, in the know in those, uh, in those things to keep those dialogues going. So uh, anybody that's involved in accessibility, I would uh, encourage you to, to sign up for that. If you go to the main page of DIR or the calendar page, bottom left corner, you'll see Stay Connected. Just click on that, you'll see the options. Many of you are interested in accessibility, so you might be interested in that list. There are others, all of the IRMs, you have a designated IT leader called an IRM if you're a state agency or state university. That's a key contact point with DIR. They belong to a separate restricted list, which is only for IRMs. But any IT person could join DIR Tech and then DIR train is really for the training communities. And then there are others. You can check them out at your leisure. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff and turn my camera off. And we will get started. Just let us change out the slide deck. Everybody see that? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off. I'd like to start out this session <clears throat> with a little storytelling on uh, an area of uh, online recruiting. <clears throat> so there's an agency, fictitious agency called Agency X, and they just completed the, the procurement and the deployment of a new web application that was designed to streamline their recruiting of new employees, managing job candidates, et cetera. And there was a company called Software Company A that developed this product for them, this custom product, and both company A and the agency did studies that talked about <clears throat> how they were gonna gain efficiencies, um, cost savings, and uh, quality of candidates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they went ahead and they implemented this new application. And of course, uh, they could reduce their, their uh, HR resources that were involved in recruiting. So they rolled some of them off into some other areas of HR. And, um, there was a programmer named Susan, top-notch programmer, and she heard about an opening at Agency X. <clears throat> so she went online and she tried to apply for this, um, for a job there to, to match that. So she went on and she started having trouble with the website because Susan was blind and the website was not made accessible. So she tried to find a contact information, but as we know, a lot of that stuff kind of just disappears into the ether once the process has been automated. But she did manage to reach somebody a couple days later, and then they said, well, we'll be back to take your information um, in a few days. So about four or five days later, <clears throat> somebody called her from uh, Agency X, and they sat down with her, and they said, okay, let's uh, get your information. What was that job rec number that you uh, were applying to? So Susan gave him the job rec number and they said, oh, oh gee, we don't have that anymore. That position was just filled. So Susan was a little bit uh, annoyed that she didn't have the opportunity to really apply for that because she felt she was pretty well qualified. And um, as many people with disabilities do, they, um, they have pretty active discussion forums. And there was a, uh, <clears throat> a civil rights attorney that kind of monitors these forums, looking for things like that to see how he can help. And so he uh, reached out to Susan and he, um, he decided that he would try to co uh, contact Agency X to talk to them uh, about this issue of accessibility. 
So he made an initial contact. <clears throat> they went back and forth a couple times. Over a period of a few weeks, the attorney realized that he was really just kind of getting the stiff arm and, and the agency was clueless. So they filed a uh, <clears throat> discrimination lawsuit under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, I know this maybe sounds like I'm telling a story, but this is the kind of stuff that happens all the time. So let's, um, <clears throat> let's think about this a little bit and say, well, you know, if we go back and we start looking at root causes, what happened that led us up to this, this whole event? Well, let's look at Agency X. They had no ICT accessibility maturity within their organization. Now, when I say ICT, a lot of us in the state call that EIR. <clears throat> Consider those interchangeable. ICT, EIR, EIT, they're all pretty much the same. But anyway, the agency wasn't mature in accessibility. What does that mean? Well, they didn't know really anything about accessibility. Um, the IRT requester for this application uh, didn't include any accessibility requirements, you know, based on lack of knowledge. And there was no language in the solicitation um, <clears throat> with regard to accessibility, no, um, no evaluation, and, and no contract language uh, in the contract as it went down, and no user acceptance criteria. Now, when you and but the bottom line is there was no <clears throat> corporate or agency ICT accessibility policy. Now, if we go to software company A, kind of the same thing. Uh, no maturity and accessibility. They didn't know about accessibility or it wasn't considered a priority. There was no technical knowledge or skills within the organization to build accessible products. Uh, accessibility was not integrated into their development process or their final result. And again, no uh, policy organization-wide on accessibility. So this was kind of a, a big problem. And of course, there was a lot of finger pointing and, you know, Agency X, uh, you know, when that complaint came into them, you know, they filed a complaint against software company A. And of course, lots of people got involved and lots of lawyers, uh, you know, the press picked up on it. So it's, it can be a very, very painful situation when one of these things occurs, which is pretty much avoidable. But if we look at what's going on in the, uh, in the industry, these kind of complaints are on the rise. Uh, they're filed as discrimination under the ADA. And <clears throat> last year, in 2019, maybe early 2020, um, Domino's website who was, that was sued for accessibility, their case made it all the way to the, uh, to the Supreme Court. So uh, I would consider them the new poster child for uh, accessibility. Now, uh, the Supreme Court decided not to hear that case and they kicked it back down into the lower courts and it's still winding its way through. But just to give you, a, you know, an indication of, of where this stuff is going today. Uh, the lawsuits have nearly tripled, um, you know, since 2013, they're, they're continuing to rise. Uh, you see that there's a little pictogram, a little uh, image I have on there that has a smattering of, of logos of different public and private sector organizations that I used to use in a bigger screen, but that's gotten so enormous that there's just no way that I could include those in, in any kind of a graphic that made sense. There's also been drive-by lawsuits where some of these um, uh, maybe less than scrupulous attorneys have uh, <clears throat> used um, scanning tools uh, kind of in a random way and then filed lawsuits or sent demand letters to uh, <clears throat> private and, and public sector organizations um, about their websites, offering to help them through that, um, you know, for in exchange for, uh, you know, compensation, et cetera. And um, there were web accessibility standards were proposed by uh, the DOJ, but they went into the inactive state. But <clears throat> it should be noted that that had little uh, impact on litigation because when all these settlements come up or cases are won, they always land on the technical standard WCAG 2 point, whatever the release is, level AA as the technical standard for compliance. So still out there, very active, and uh, everybody needs to pay attention to it. Now, when we talk about these kind of regulations, um, <clears throat> there's IT regulations all over the world, many countries, uh, most cite some kind of a technical standard. 
Um, in the U.S., we follow the um, U.S. Section 508, which is a federal procurement um, regulation, and the state of Texas has elected to kind of harmonize around that with a few modifications. Um, and just as a note, 508 became effective in, in the first place back in January of uh, 2000, and it was refreshed in 2018 for compliance by federal agencies. And, um, you know, it is references uh, WCAG 2.0 as the technical standard, as we have now aligned in the state of Texas. And of course, we have our uh, administrative code that maps not only to the uh, technical standards in 508, uh, we also have governance criteria that talks about things like uh, procurement and exceptions. And I'll talk about that in just a, a few minutes. So we're here to talk about procurement and uh, I call it what the uh, procurement dependency. So the deal is that um, vendor sourced IT products and services make up the uh, majority of IT in almost any organization. Nobody's out there building their own stuff completely for their own use and running, you know, autonomously on all that stuff. Most of it is, is, is procured. And we don't see that kind of a thing going away in, uh, in the foreseeable future. <clears throat> and so everybody in public and private sector is dependent on buying accessible products and services. And one way that when you're trying to buy these kinds of things, you are provided documentation from these different vendors. And what we're really trying to get to here is how good is that documentation? Well, for commercial off-the-shelf products, uh, levels of accessibility for are documented in, a, um, in what's called a voluntary product accessibility template <clears throat> or VPAT um, is the blank template. Once it's completed, it turns into an ACR or accessibility conformance report. And um, that goes through WCAG and <clears throat> a number of different other things. But the problem with those is accuracy varies just wildly from vendor to vendor and product to product. I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit. And then for development services, like when you go out to buy somebody's services to build a website or a web application, uh, it's not commercial off the shelf, right? It's all custom. And so there are no VPATs and they don't apply. So other forms of uh, documentation and assessment have to be used in order to try to ascertain uh, the vendor's abilities to produce a end product that's accessible. So when we talk about <clears throat> bad uh, documentation that we get from vendors in a lot of different ways, there's um, a lot of impacts that that can, uh, that that can cause. And uh, when you're trying to procure products, it can cause uh, contract delays. A lot of times those contracts could be on hold until accurate documents uh, or requests for supplemental information are received or evaluated. Uh, the products with inaccurate documents could actually be eliminated from uh, multi-manufacturer contracts. So, <clears throat> you know, this is kind of a dilemma that uh, a lot of resellers uh, have, to, have to deal with. Um, a customer could choose to just cease negotiations with a vendor because they've been trying to get uh, quality documentation. The vendor can't provide it or vice versa. The vendor could just, you know, lift up his arms and say, well, you know, this isn't worth it. We're just not going to bid on this contract. And so those are kind of a lot of the things in the, in the solicitation process in, can, that can occur. But when we, once the contract is awarded, now you've got the product that is out there and it's being used and <clears throat> the bottom line, the inaccurate uh, documents are gonna actually misrepresent the product. And so, uh, and, and in some cases, like in the, in the case of, of DIR, when folks are buying off of our contracts, I get a lot of questions about, <clears throat> you know, since it's in your list, is it assumed to be fully compliant? And uh, a lot of people base their their uh, buying decisions on that. And of course, that's, uh, <clears throat> we, we don't do that. We can't possibly do that. I, I can talk about that in, in a little while. Um, and then also, you know, once those things are deployed, there's an impact to users with disabilities, right? Um, either employees or members of the public, it's if an outwardly facing um, application, and that results in uh, discrimination complaints, like the scenario that I painted uh, early on in the 
when we got started. It can invoke re warranties and remedies clauses requiring the vendors to mitigate issues or customers to seek legal remedies because <clears throat> in a lot of cases, they may not even be able to uh, mitigate those issues. And ultimately, uh, could result in a, uh, in a contract termination. So where does accessibility apply? And I, I get this question a lot, and I see a lot of different responses from, from vendors. And I have a kind of a very simple way <clears throat> to think about it. And uh, when I talk to the vendors, I, I try to explain that to them. And um, it's basically if the hardware or software included any hosted services has a user interface of any kind, that a customer or a member of the public interacts with, ICT accessibility applies. So with hardware, it could be, you know, control panels, <clears throat> you know, flat screens on, on printers, uh, any associated uh, software or firmware, you know, for setup, et cetera. Those would all be applicable in course software, applications, websites, admin consoles, <clears throat> management consoles, diagnostics, training, uh, training videos and training applications, uh, portals, even development tools and the output that they produce. All of those would have some kind of a user interface. Now, a lot of, uh, I get a lot of responses that say, well, we're claiming a back office exemption, um, <clears throat> but a back office exemption really only applies to service personnel interaction. So, if a factory trained technician comes into your machine room and he has to go in there and set up a machine in a certain way and, and it's nobody from the, uh, a member of the public or nobody from your, uh, <clears throat> from a, uh, a state agency or anything like that is involved, that's the only way that I view a back office exemption to be applicable. So whenever you see that back office exemption <clears throat> from somebody, um, you know, it can evoke some questions. So how do you make sure that you, um, you're buying uh, products that are as accessible as can be, or at least basing your decisions on accurate documentation provided by vendors? <clears throat> well, the key thought there is engage an, ex an accessibility subject matter expert throughout the procurement life cycle, right? So in the solicitation, uh, that person should be involved in reviewing and creating the solicitation language and whatever documents are required for vendors to respond to, communicating about accessibility requirements at pre-bid conferences or other forms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, pre-solicitation um, pre or, or pre-bid kind of activities, and then develop an evaluation methodology, and, which could even include scoring metrics on how you're going to score these, um, these responses. Then <clears throat> once you've gotten these responses back in, you know, you have to kind of look at these submissions in the evaluation phase. And you, what you really need to do is have these uh, documents evaluated for credibility and accuracy. <clears throat> and um, in our TAC rules, we actually, um, we actually talk about credible evidence. So that's really what they're looking for. And then once you've looked at those initial uh, pass of the documents, you can follow up with vendors on those responses, you know, requesting additional information as needed, uh, you know, with the vendors, evaluating additional documents uh, that they send to you. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I do uh, when it's a development service request, I'll go out onto their website and I'll just go check their homepage with a, uh, with a page checker and see if, how accessible their homepage is. That can give you an indication of, uh, you know, them eating their own dog food. Um, and then what that subject matter expert will do is make recommendations on the procurement based on those findings. And then, I, you know, obviously there's a whole bunch of other things that go into a, uh, into a procurement and, um, and that'll be factored in in whatever <clears throat> way, shape or form it's determined by the procurement uh, uh, folks in the organization. Then in the contract language, um, make sure that you've got, you know, specific accessibility uh, information in there and the requirements for the deliverables, make sure the technical standards are in there, uh, making sure that, you know, if it's a development project, make sure you've got some uh, accessibility built into the checkpoints as things get developed, uh, review of test plans and the executed results. 
and then uh, what the plans are for corrective actions and revenues and warranties. And when you get to the solicitation, it's important that the requirements are well defined. So you have to have that technical spec in there. And uh, most folks will use 508 or WCAG. Uh, in some ways, it's a little bit redundant because 508 does point to WCAG, but in, I don't think that it's uh, a bad thing to be a little bit redundant in this case because you still see a lot of vendors who won't, don't really pay attention to those requirements and submit responses anyway. <clears throat> and that you require accurate documents <clears throat> and using the forms either specified or included. So for COTS, it's uh, accessibility conformance reports or ACRs. For development applications, um, we created a form of DIR called Vendor Accessibility Development Services Information Request or BATSER. And uh, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And also policy-driven adoption, which is something that you may or may not have heard of. <clears throat> and this is really how we kind of look at organizational maturity of the companies that are submitting and using that as, a, as an additional data point to kind of check and balance the other things that have, uh, come, uh, that have come in. And again, I just want to uh, recap that our administrative rules uh, require DIR and all agencies to obtain credible evidence of the vendor's ability, capability to produce accessible EIR products and services. <clears throat> Such evidence may include, but not limited to, a vendor's internal accessibility policy documents, contractual warranties for accessibility, accessibility testing documents, and examples of prior work results. So this is the um, accessibility language on this slide, and I don't expect everybody to read it, but you'll have a copy of this. <clears throat> and this is the language that we put into our solicitations for cooperative contracts and uh, <clears throat> also for other things that we buy directly, uh, the DIR uses or for enterprise kind of contracts. And again, we talk about what's needed for COTS, what's needed for non-COTS, and uh, again, the policy-driven adoption for self-assessment. So there's usually, when there's a, a, a large procurement that has all different components, all three of those have to, have to be uh, submitted in return. So for VPATS, <clears throat> and we get a lot of questions on that, and I'm sure that a lot of the folks out there still have questions on them, what they are are formal statements of compliance documenting accessibility to U.S. Section 508 technical standards and WCAG 2. Dot. I have an X there because there's different levels of that. <clears throat> and from the state of Texas, we don't really care other than it's 2.0 or higher. ACRs have to be completed by the manufacturers. And the reason I say that, I think that'll, uh, you'll see that in, in a minute. Um, so the COTS products and services utilize a form that's an industry standard form that's, that's out there at the link that uh, is, is on this chart. It's by a uh, industry organization. Uh, the instructions are included in the template and uh, they have to be manufacturer generated. Uh, responses and product and product family specific. <clears throat> and then um, the way that these are really supposed to be completed is using accessibility test results performed by individuals that are trained in uh, generally accepted accessibility test methods and tools and supported by additional documentation on request. They really need to be accurate and inaccurate claims uh, can carry potential risks to both customers and manufacturers. And I think, uh, you know, my previous slides kind of told the story on that. So let's look at the, uh, the ACR. This is the VPAT template of old, right? This is the one that was called the VPAT 1.0. Um, there's a title, um, title field in there, <clears throat> information. Doesn't have much in there, date, name of product, contact for more information. Even with that little bit of information that was needed, you'd be surprised how many folks left that blank. So if that's, in, if that's not completely filled out, the, uh, the, you know, the document is, is invalid. And um, there's the main sections of the criteria. In this case, they were um, you know, these, these highlighted in, in blue, these six sections. And then supporting features was the degree of compliance. <clears throat> and then 
in the supporting, in the remarks and ex in explanations, that's where when you put a level of support and supporting features, you're supposed to explain that uh, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the field and remarks and explanations. Now, um, those sections 1194, 21, all the way to 26, uh, some of those will be uh, completed depending on the type of product. Um, you complete the functional performance criteria if none of those other ones apply and always completed is information, documentation, and support. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is we still see these, um, we still see these VPATs. We see them for older products where they, they still are in price list, but they haven't really made any changes uh, over the last couple of years. And so therefore they haven't moved to the new VPAT template. And uh, this is kind of the new VPAT template. Um, note the uh, different amount of detail that's required in the title block, not just the product, but the version, a description, the date of the report, contact information, notes, evaluation methods used. That's a very uh, important field <clears throat> that was added, and uh, you can tell a lot from that. And then in some ways very similar, you have the criteria, the performance level, and the remarks, but what you can see here is all the criteria in the left-hand column is all from the WCAG uh, 2.0, that's level A, and it goes down into double A. But in the conformance level, there are different kinds of, of IT. So if it's a, if it's a, a web application, um, you, know, you would be completing that. If it's a software application, you would be completing that field, authoring tools. So it's gonna be specific depending on what kind of a product uh, that uh, they're reporting on. And then whatever um, they have in there for the conformance level, like for web, if it says partially supports, then you would need to have supporting information in the, uh, in the remarks and the explanations. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the contrast between uh, those two. I don't really have time to go in depth into this, <clears throat> into how to complete a VPAT, but there's some things on, online that are available that will, will help you with that. Now, when you're analyzing VPATs and, and ACRs, I'm not sure whether you got the gist of that by my, uh, <clears throat> my, the manner of my uh, discussion, but be skeptical. They can contain false, inaccurate, or misleading information, and that's why it's important to engage in accessibility SME or other trained accessibility professional to analyze those. So this is just kind of a, a by all means, not meant to be fully inclusive, but when you're thinking about looking at these VPATs, these are some of the red flags <clears throat> that I generally see that make the, the antenna go up on, on the back of my head. When a vendor comes back and asks, what's a VPAT? That's, um, that can be a sign that uh, there's going to be some issues. Sometimes uh, you won't get a VPAT for a product when you know that, uh, that having a VPAT is, uh, is applicable because it's got user interfaces. I see a lot of these VPATs coming in with, um, uh, there's no VPAT, but they'll, uh, some vendor will issue some you know, flowery, global, nonspecific, oh, we want to comply and we make every effort, blah, blah, blah. That's not a VPAT, okay? That's just, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not valid. And then I've seen a single VPAT representing a mixed set of product types and vendor offering. So I'm sorry, but you, a, a vendor can't put their whole portfolio under one VPAT, you know, if their portfolio consists of different kinds of products like laptops and printers and storage devices and mainframe. All of those kind of families of products are, are going to need separate VPATs. Um, and then blank fields in the, in the title block, you know, missing the product name or the version. Uh, a blank or irrelevant response to evaluation methods used. <clears throat> you know, you want to see something in there that says, we use a combination of automated accessibility testing and the testing with, uh, uh, you know, assistive technologies and code inspection and blah, blah, blah. Uh, one of the ones that kind of raises a red flag to me is they say, based on general product knowledge. Um, and so you're pretty much assured if they're just basing it on general product knowledge that they're not going to be able to find everything and there's going to be some surprises at the end. So you have to be really uh, careful about that. ACR is dated back multiple years using the old uh, VPAT template, 
but newer products exist or are quoted, and you know that to be true because they're in the price list. Uh, incomplete sections or the use of not applicable in areas of a VPAT that you know are to be, to, to be applicable. Um, VPATs created by the reseller and not the offering manufacturer. <clears throat> a lot of times, like if you have three or four um, uh, manufacturer brands in there and they all look very, very similar, you know, same format, same responses, it's a good indication that maybe the reseller actually um, put those together. And that's going to result in um, misrepresenting the product, uh, usually in a big way. No information in the uh, uh, remarks columns at all that describe their report, the supporting features. Little or no remarks when partially supports is claimed. Uh, supports or non-A for all responses in the supporting features column. So that's just kind of a good idea of a lot of these these red flags on, on VPATs. So when these uh, documents are, uh, are questionable, you know, follow up with questions. And these are perfectly legitimate to ask a, a vendor. What tools and methods were used to complete this ACR? <clears throat> uh, if you're not satisfied with what they put in the uh, evaluation methods and the uh, responses don't look credible. What client platforms, <clears throat> operating systems, mobile browser, mobile, uh, browsers, assistive technologies, and versions were used as test environments. Can your company provide a copy of the test plan for the product? Can they provide results of the accessibility testing? What issues were found and are there corrective actions in place to resolve them or is this or in a subsequent release and when will that be? Now, if a vendor with, these, with a questionable ACR uh, cannot or will not provide the supplemental information, you have to assume that the product is non-compliant <clears throat> with the technical standards and that you need to look at that by performing a risk assessment as part of the decision process. One thing I want to just emphasize with everybody is there's probably a couple of handfuls of products in the whole world that are fully compliant <clears throat> or very, very close to being fully compliant. And so um, we know that almost everything is not. But what we do expect is the documents to be accurate so people can base the decisions on the levels of accessibility that are there and ascertain how much risk they're going to have if they go ahead and, and proceed with the procurement. And then TAC rules require agencies to file an exception for not fully compliant ICT. And hopefully we'll get to that <clears throat> at the end. I've got one slide on that. Now, I, I talked a little bit about development services. They don't have a VPAT, so uh, how, do we, how do we figure out you know, if a vendor's capable? So for solicitations, you define the standard that you want the deliverables to meet. You require credible evidence of, the, of their ability to produce accessible deliverables. And we've got these two forms that we use, the, the VATSER form that we developed at DIR, <clears throat> and then policy-driven adoption for accessibility, which we use. It's being used by some other states. And even the General Services Administration lists this as an additional uh, resource. resource. And then you inform the vendor that additional documents may also be requested based on the responses to the initial uh, submissions and um, that you're going to need accessibility test results prior to final uh, deliverable uh, acceptance. And if the vendor is if the vendor comes in and just says that they're going to do everything and they don't, they're just going to test at the end for accessibility, but nothing has really been integrated into the, into the uh, earlier phases of development, it's a sure bet that there's going to be problems that may or may not be fixable. So you need to really uh, be careful about that. <clears throat> and then my, I mentioned this earlier, does the vendor eat his own dog food? Is its own public website accessible? I've seen a lot of uh, surprise looks on vendors' faces when you tell them you've been out to their website <clears throat> and it's not accessible when they're trying to uh, show how accessible they can, they can build a product. So this is the VATSER form. I, I realize it's a little small on this slide, but it's only six questions and they're open-ended and um, <clears throat> they address different areas of, uh, of accessibility that we think are, are uh, help them, you know, believe that they're, uh, that they're capable. You know, the first one relates to their policy and culture. You know, do you have uh, 
accessibility integrated into your key business processes, et cetera. Describe the skills and, and training that you uh, provide or that you obtain for your people that are developing this stuff. Uh, what kind of uh, development tools and test environments do you use? Do you have a correct, corrective actions process for accessibility? Um, do you have uh, alternate means of access or workarounds when things are deemed not accessible so that people could still, you know, mostly use the application? And this is the one that uh, is really valuable. Put some uh, links in here to prior examples of your work that, of accessible websites. So these, these questions are pretty open-ended. They need to be evaluated by, again, somebody who understands accessibility, but they can be very telling. And then once you get the responses to that initial uh, form, you can start asking uh, questions about all that, similar, similarly to what you do, like I showed you on, uh, on uh, ACR results. So for language and, and services procurements, <clears throat> you need to be pretty specific in contract language. You need to have formal checkpoints throughout the uh, development process. So you know, have to have some language about accessibility and planning in the design, development, test, et cetera. Um, and then you as the customer need to have uh, approval and, and uh, reviewing of uh, authority for the plans and tools used for testing so that you know you're going to get a correct outcome. And uh, language in there on how test results are going to be provided and when, uh, what the corrective actions process is and how that's defined in the life cycle when things are discovered either pre-production or post-production. Uh, you know, specific language related to remedies and warranties. Uh, if it's not, um, if you don't feel like it's well covered in, your, in the overall remedies and warranties and some final acceptance criteria that you can, uh, that you can establish. Now, you know, some of this responsibility belongs to project managers. <clears throat> and so I've got a list of PM questions that um, I've kind of got showing here that need to be considered. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that make sure that, that everything is in place, especially on some of these larger projects or MERPs, um, you know, that are required to make sure that accessibility is, is uh, kind of fully integrated. So, you know, is the language in the procurement documents? Uh, and then over on the right side, we talk a little bit about what is needed in each of those, making sure that you've got somebody from accessibility engaged, um, you know, has uh, criteria been established in all phases of the project? Are the resources in place? Have the resources been trained? Are the, are the platforms enabled to produce accessible output? Um, you know, just make sure that you've got all that stuff uh, in place. And this really applies whether you're uh, outsourcing a development program or whether you're doing it internally. And then, you know, has the uh, ICT been tested at unit levels during development and throughout UAT using automated and manual uh, test tools and methods? So when we talk about evaluation and validation of a, uh, <clears throat> of a product, um, it used to be, and still is in a lot of places, where agencies and, and uh, as on the federal level, state levels, you know, they have test organizations. And when they get a product from a, uh, a, uh, a result of a procurement contract, the vendor throws it over the wall, and then the agency or the company goes out and they start testing this thing to make sure that it meets the accessibility uh, requirements. Well, I kind of look at that with a car analogy. If you were going to buy a car and you were out there shopping for the safest car, you do all your research, you select a car, you're not going to bring it home, you're not going to crash it into a wall to see if it made the, uh, <clears throat> the safety, uh, complied with the safety standards. Of course you're not. And so that's the same way that we need to treat vendor sourced IT. The burden of proof belongs to the vendor and not the customer. They need to be producing credible evidence all along they need to have contractual language, uh, you know, in the agreement and a final deliverables uh, statement of compliance. So they're the ones who need to be providing the, the testing, you know, end-to-end -end testing, sharing the results, showing what the corrective actions are to, uh, to remediate errors. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that um, you as the customer should do nothing and just take everything at face value but you don't have to do full-blown testing of anything that you buy. 
you can look at their test results. You have your accessibility professionals look over the test results, see where the issues are, and then you can actually go in with somebody and do some sniff testing uh, just to validate that the documents they sent you are uh, in fact uh, credible or you know to the best of their knowledge um, accurate. <clears throat> and then once you get that uh, final deliverable is ready, you know you might consider a letter from the vendor. Uh, for go live that uh, it's been developed and tested in accordance with accessibility practices results are accurate in the testing and the deliverable uh, complies with accessibility standards and then have some notes in there where in fact it's documented that it doesn't but there are corrective action plans in place and that all needs to uh, <clears throat> you know as set forth if you have the right language in the in the contract or the sow now, the last thing I want to talk about briefly is the <clears throat> policy driven adoption for accessibility. And this talks about the maturity of an organization's uh, policy, which kind of can tell you how well they can uh, produce accessible offerings. And it, it's the integration of governance as opposed to technical criteria into an organization that helps enable them to, uh, to drive themselves to, to uh, improve accessibility over time. It can be applied to any public or private sector organization, but <clears throat> it's really handy to use in procurement because it helps drive vendor awareness and you know, helping them progress towards achieving more accessible offerings in the long term. So again, I don't know why, just coincidentally, with the number six criteria, but the criteria are all centered around you know, policy creation, you know, do you, does this company have a, and are they implementing a policy? Organization, you know, do they have somebody with a accessibility stamped on their forehead <clears throat> and, uh, you know, have pieces and parts in place throughout the organization to make sure that they can implement accessibility consistently, uh, which includes integration into accessibility criteria into all the phases, uh, providing processes for uh, addressing inaccessible ICT, making sure that they have skills in place, and then making sure that they have information that they can, uh, they can share with, with customers on their policy, their plans, and that can even include you know, VPATs or, or VATSERVs, making sure that that is all accurate and they <clears throat> have the ability to, to share it. So there's three phases in the maturity model launch, integrate, and optimize. <clears throat> and you see a little bar chart down on the bottom. We, uh, there's a questionnaire that we send out to vendors and, as, and they're required to complete that. As they complete that, that it's really an Excel spreadsheet at this point, it just populates this little bar chart and it shows them where they are <clears throat> in their journey towards uh, optimized uh, accessibility. And on this slide, uh, the, the full template is over there to the right next to the bar. You can see a little bit more about the bar. I think there's 61 questions, uh, 61 uh, total points, and then we convert that into a percentage, of course. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's used, it can be used by uh, private and public organizations to even guide their own journeys in accessibility. But like I say, we use it as a uh, procurement uh, tool. Uh, you know, it helps assess the vendor's ability to produce offerings, gauge confidence in their other documentation, uh, and we can track vendor progress. So if they're submitting to bids, you know, multiple times a year or every two years and they complete this form, we would expect to see higher levels of maturity. And if they stay flat at zero and say, yeah, we're not interested in the policy, yeah, we're not, you know, at some point, you know, we may decide not to uh, do business with them anymore because it carries with it too much risk. And then <clears throat> this is just a quick scoring example. If you had all three components in there where you have COTS, development services, and, um, uh, and PDAA, <clears throat> excuse me. So the VPAT scoring, we score from zero to three, and zero means the VPAT was required, but they didn't provide one all the way to credible, uh, accessible documentation for all or most of the products. So those get us, each one of those gets assigned a point value, you know, to normalize it into a percentage. PPAT scores from zero to 100, and so that's just, you know, it, it is what it is. 
Um, and then um, the development services, um, that is a um, either SAT or unsat, you know, and based on how they completed that uh, development of that sort of form. So then you can, you take that now that you've assigned all these, you know, you've got uh, percentages in there and let's say that this is scoring is up to 15% of the procurement. So when you do, a, if you look across here, you know, you've got a satisfactory dev, dev services is 100 points. The VPAT rating is two, 60 points. The VPAT score is 97. So you get an accessibility score of 85.67%, which is a pretty high rating. And then if that counts as 15% of the procurement, then you take 15% of that. And that come, you come up with the final score of uh, 12. Uh, you know, 85 or somewhere in there. So that's kind of just one example of how you might uh, score that. And you can also see a lot of the comments in there uh, as well. So it's just one, one methodology that we've used on some, uh, on some enterprise contracts. Then of course, um, state agencies and state funded IHEs are required to uh, file exceptions when things aren't fully compliant. And um, really what this is has to be signed by your, the head of your agency. It's a risk acceptance. So you're really, the head of your agency is accepting the risk of a, a non-compliant product. Um, and this should really be made before the contract award is done because if you, you know, if you award the contract and then you stick it in front of the nose of your, uh, your ED or the president or chancellor, you know, you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's already done. So it becomes a rubber stamp. And guess what? You know, your senior manager has, uh, has accepted the risk, whether he, you know, whether he meant to or wanted to or not. So be aware of that. It should be signed before uh, the contract is awarded. It does not eliminate the risk associated with non-accessible IT. I get that all the time. It is just, has, it just allows you to be in compliance with the rules, but you know, the ADA trumps that, so be aware of that. It doesn't eliminate the responsibility to provide an accessible solution, and there should be good justification in the form, and uh, should also include a plan for compliance. Um, you know, maybe that's an 800 number for people that can't access it, a desk side assist, let's say, if it's an internal thing by a manager, uh, and as I said, it should be signed by the head of the organization. So let me just wrap up. I've been <clears throat> talking nonstop here. I'm going to open it up for questions in a second. Procuring accessible IT can be challenging. Know what to ask for in solicitations, what specs, what forms to use. Know how to analyze vendor responses, examine for credible evidence and red flags. Request additional information as deemed appropriate, you know, test tools, test plans, results, talk about that. Use solid contract language, specifications, checkpoints, et cetera, et cetera, and even a compliance statement at the end if it's a development uh, contract. Uh, ensure accessibility has been performed by vendor prior to accepting final deliverables, and that's really important for dev services. Engage accessibility professionals throughout the process and file exceptions for inaccessible IT and include a justification and in future compliance plans. So the last page here is just reference information. If you look at the top one there, I wanna go ahead and just mention, if, if you don't know, uh, DIR has a, uh, a learning management system <clears throat> that's available to any state employee or uh, state funded employee of a, of a higher ed. Uh, which is a, a learning management system, and it deals with every aspect of uh, accessibility. You can go in there and drill in and get the answer to one thing and with one particular course or, or subject, or you can go in there and go from one to N and complete a whole course and curriculum. Very valuable. I've talked about that a number of times. We have close to 1,000 people enrolled. We've had close to 1,000 uh, course completions. I would urge everybody in every organization uh, under DIR's purview to take advantage of this. And then I've just got a few other ones here. Um, <clears throat> and then the policy driven adoption. Um, and there's one in there, <clears throat> strategic organization, uh, strategic IT uh, accessibility. Uh, that's a book that, uh, that I wrote. And uh, I think that's I'm not trying to you know, plug or sell books here, but I think it's a very valuable book and uh, it's been well received throughout the industry over the last 10 years. 
I just did the second edition uh, earlier uh, this year. Okay, well, that's all I have. I, I know that was a mouthful, so I hope nobody was trying to take notes. You'll, you'll have the slides, and uh, I will turn it back over to Joy. Great, and if you want to turn your camera back on while we do Q&A. So we've got about six minutes for questions. Remember, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A pane. It'll get lost in the chat window. So first one, in the solicitation phase, does DIR have specific approved language that should be included in contracts? Um, we have that, that page that I showed you for, um, in solicitations, that's the language that is uh, in our uh, in our standard template. So, uh, it, with regard to contracts, yes, we do have some some standard language. I, I didn't uh, I didn't share that. It may vary a little bit from depending on what kind of contract it is. Um, but you can go out and look at any one of our contracts <clears throat> uh, by by vendor name or by vendor topic. Every contract, DIR has a page out there for every vendor that we uh, have a contract with. <clears throat> and the full contract is out there. You can review those okay. at your uh, discretion. And is that an area where the DIR accessibility list that peers could share with each other on that type of thing? Um, we do not, um, in terms of the results, in terms of the BPATs and the documents that we get, we don't really share that. Um, because the problem is, is that stuff is really only good on the day that it's done. And so what we always uh, recommend is that when you're getting ready to buy a, a, a product or a service that you go directly to the vendor and ask them for the most recent, uh, the most recent VPAT. With regard to the Batser form, quite honestly, um, if they don't, uh, if, if their responses to that are unsatisfactory and we've had a, a discussion with them that we're not satisfied with, Typically for development services, um, we will not put them on the DR list for contracts. Okay. So uh, this one is, my organization is currently working on updating our VPAT. My question is, what are some generally accepted accessibility test methods or evaluation methods? <clears throat> well, um, you know, the, the most important thing is, um, is that you need to do a combination of uh, automated and manual in inspection methods. And an automated method for like a website, for example, would be a, uh, you know, you could, you could check page by page using a page checker. You can use scanning tools that'll actually spider down through a whole, um, a whole website. Applications are a little different because you can't really, you have to rely on probably page checkers for that but then making sure that you're testing manually with a screen reader or other assistive technology. Uh, there's other visual inspections that you use. There's a lot of information on that reference page. You can go to the W3C page. Uh, it'll give you some guidance on, on how to test for accessibility. Um, somebody who's qualified to do it, you know, you know, it takes a long time to use a screen reader, so it can't be just anybody who just gets on with a screen reader to try to test. Can you suggest some tools that can be used to check the accessibility of a vendor's web page? Um, well, I don't want to, um, I'm not sure that I can really promote anybody's, uh, anybody's products, but there are uh, checking tools that are out there. If you do a search on, on accessibility testing tools or automated tools, um, I, there's a, a nonprofit called, um, Web Aim. It's run by a guy named Jerry uh, Jared Smith. They do have a tool out there that that I use. It's a free tool. You can plug it right into your um, right into your browser called Wave, and it's a very good uh, page checking tool. Very easy to use. And, and uh, but there are a number of them that are that are all good. They're all you know they're kind of all about the same. Okay. Do you ever use waiting on accessibility requirements? Example, making one requirement worth more than another. Well, if you mean requirements in terms of success criteria in the technical standard, uh, no. <clears throat> and uh, we've gone back and forth in my old job at IBM and here. Um, if you try to do that, some person, some group of people with disabilities is going to get the short end of the stick. 
And so I really don't think that that's a, a useful exercise. You know, you want to try to comply as much as possible with all. We only have about one more minute, so we're going to need to wrap up. What should people do if they have additional questions? Well, if they have additional questions, um, our website is a good source uh, of information or <clears throat> talk to your accessibility coordinator. Uh, every agency is required by rule to have one and uh, hopefully they can provide uh, some information for you. Uh, if they can't or you can't find them, um, then uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. My, uh, my email address is on the, uh, the first slide. Okay, I think that's gonna be all the questions that we have time for right now. We are approaching 3.30. Jeff, thank you for sharing this. We really do appreciate it. So everybody is going to get a copy of the presentation, the CPE form, uh, Jeff, let's include information on that accessibility university and anything else Jeff thinks of that might be valuable to you. Yeah, there's a, on Excellent. the access you, there's a link in there for that. Perfect, perfect. Well, we appreciate it. And DIR staff who were helping me behind the scenes, I think all we have left is Tracy, but thank you. We appreciate that help too. So I think this is a wrap. Everybody have a nice afternoon.